Hey, hey, what's going on, everyone? So, running behind today. Um, sorry about that. Uh, but we'll wait a little while, and then uh, we'll we'll get started with the live from there. So, today I wanted to cover um, a state of ambivalence, which a lot of people run into, unfortunately, in today's culture. And uh, that's kind of basically just knowing you need to change, but then not wanting to uh, basically let go of behaviors that are leading to excess weight gain or health issues or anything of that sort. And you get a lot of people in this situation. So obviously, like the vast majority of Americans, Hector, uh, URL, let me know if I pronounced that correctly. Um, Stefan, good to see you. Thanks for jumping in here. So today we'll be talking about, I'm just going to wait a little while for some other people to jump in, but today we'll be talking about um, ambivalence and how to overcome it. So a good situation is you have a, let's say like a 40-year-old male that's overweight and maybe on a couple of different medications that they don't want to be on, but uh, they don't want to kind of let go of the behaviors that are leading to those health issues. Uh, so they have kind of contradictory goals. On the one hand, they do want to be healthy and maybe aesthetically appealing and healthy. But uh, on the other hand, unfortunately, they just don't want to let go of those ideas or behaviors or belief systems that led to that excess weight gain or aesthetic challenges or high blood pressure, depression, anxiety, or whatever whatever else they, they feel they need to use medications for. Uh, Freddie, good to see you. Stefan, thanks for jumping in. Uh, let me know. Let me know also if you guys have any questions at all. I'm happy to kind of diverge and just go on random topics. Uh, but the general idea today is ambivalence. And we'll be talking about it from the re reference point of health challenges. Johnny, good to see you of health challenges. But honestly, ambivalence could be on anything like finan financial issues, relationships, etc., etc. And the main issue there is you, you want to achieve one thing, but you don't want to let go of behavior patterns that are uh, basically prohibiting you from achieving that. So obviously there's this gray area and a lot of people are unfortunately in that area uh, these days as well. And I'm going to be covering the, the main aspects that keep them in a state of ambivalence with a lot of people for, for their whole entire life. Uh, because you do see like a lot of, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 year olds, I even had 70 year olds, you know, uh, reach out to me for health advice and I tell them to do ABC and they're like, well, I'll do it next year. And I'm like, dude, next year, come on, like you're 70 already, dude. You know, the average American dies at about 76 or so. Uh, what do you mean by next year? And they always kind of fall into this loop of like next year, next month, next week, tomorrow. Uh, but remember, it's, it's always important to understand that change can only happen in the now. It can never happen in the future. Okay. So it could only happen right now. Um, and it's important to remember and important to kind of catch your, yourself with the myriad of lies you tell, you might, you might be telling yourself to, to keep yourself stuck in a state of ambivalence. So, um, here are there, once again, you guys try not to listen to people blindly online. This includes me. I'm not even afraid to mention myself in this as well. Because there are no absolutes in mental and physical health, and it's impossible really to give you solid health advice without knowing your specific situation, your specific challenges, and your goals as well, uh, and what you've tried in the past, and, and a myriad of other things. So those are all important. And without knowing that, um, the person that is speaking to you or that you're listening to online, etc., they might be competent, and in most cases, they actually aren't. Uh, but the thing is, they never met you personally, so they can't come up with a solution for you. And these kind of lives or podcasts in general are more of a, more of a way to kind of brainstorm possible ideas uh, that could come to a resolution of a specific issue. But then it's your responsibility to um, to basically do further investigation and stuff of that sort. So I'm just going to give a random example let's say we have, I'm just going to give a random example of how this person could possibly be staying in a state of ambivalence their whole entire life. So let's say we have a 40-year-old uh, male. 40-year-old male, uh, let's just say no kids um, and 30 pounds overweight or 40 or 50 pounds overweight. So remember the average American today is about 28% body fat. 
Um, 20% is basically overweight for male and 25% and above is obese. So pretty much if you have um, like a noticeable amount of lower chest fat, even a bit and, and a bit of a gut, you're probably already at 20%. And if it's a bit more noticeable than that, like it's kind of protruding through your belt line quite a bit, uh, you're already at 25%. So obese and pretty much 85% of Americans are either overweight or obese. So we can round up a little bit and just say 90% for the sake of it. So most likely... Um, a lot of people that don't think they are overweight are actually just very overweight um, and very unhealthy for the most part. Uh, but just the, the problem with today's culture is just there are so many people that are so much more overweight in comparison to, to them. The subject in mind may not believe they are overweight, but in fact they are. It's just the person next to them at work or whatever, their friends is just far more overweight. So it's kind of tough to tell simply because standards have dropped so much which is one thing that keeps people in a, in a state of ambivalence. Amet, good to see you. Thanks for jumping in. Uh, we're talking about ambivalence today and um, why people have such a hard time changing, especially with excess weight, especially with the mountains of health information online today. Everyone has access to PubMed.gov. I mean, there's so much research into nutrition and exercise science for free online, uh, but yet... People keep getting more and more overweight, more and more medically drugged up, et cetera, et cetera. And I just don't think more information is going to help us here. I think just returning back to mastering the basic information that was available a long time ago and moreover, catching people in kind of self-sabotaging behaviors or belief systems uh, that don't facilitate health conscious choices and changing those, uh, then health and wellness becomes very easy. So for example, today we have a 40 year old male let's say 30 pounds overweight and on two prescriptions, let's just say like a antidepressant and some, uh, I don't know, high blood pressure medication or something like that. So those are, those are very, very common uh, prescriptions. And you have to ask yourself, like this person is 40 years old and their goal is to lose weight. But the thing is with, with weight loss, it's, it's one of the easiest things to do. And in fact, a lot of people think losing weight is the end goal or or the end of the journey like that's it i've lost my 30 pounds i've completed my health journey but really losing weight when you lose excess weight and return back to a normal body fat percentage for males it's between 12 to 10 percent that's just the beginning of your journey so you've gone from a negative let's say 28 percent to uh to a neutral which is 12 to 10 percent and now it's really time to begin your your health and wellness journey in particular, really kind of digging deep into what is going on in that belief system that led to all that excess weight gain and in the acceptance of doing a lot of those behaviors that led to the accumulation of a lot of weight, which inevitably leads to a lot of uh, mental and physical pathology. Mental pathology being from um, lowered self-esteem, something as basic as that, and physical pathology being all sorts of uh, increased chances of all sorts of cancers and other, other diseases, skin issues, joint issues. If you become heavy enough, you'll notice your knees and ankles and hips, probably lower back hurt quite a bit, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But you got to ask yourself, like this person is 40 years old, 40 year old male. They've had four decades to basically come up with a, a solution to something extremely simple as losing weight. And they still haven't done it. And let's just say they even have the information to do it because it is available online. And they're still not able to do something as simple as lose weight. So you got to ask, what is going on with this individual? So in in certain situations, I find that uh, it is it is a lack of knowledge, a lack of uh, knowledge about nutrition, how to stay in a proper caloric deficit, uh, what real food is and eat, what real food even is. Although exercise is such a small and almost invisible portion of a fat loss journey, they may not even know how to work out properly. And they may just be getting just random YouTube videos on how to do random stuff in the gym, but don't really have a comprehension of how to set up a proper periodized program uh, that's that's tailored to them because everyone has a different injury background and, and different goals and different starting places. And they don't they don't have that knowledge, but I find that that is a or, or they don't know how to sleep properly or 
uh, how to manage their central nervous system. Like they think, you know, working in a toxic work environment is okay and normal because everyone is doing it, but it's totally, uh, totally not okay. It's been kind of normalized because it's so common, but just because it's common doesn't mean it's good for you. And um, my biggest piece of advice personally that I follow is like, look at what the general population is doing and simply do the opposite. And you'll probably have better mental and physical health because normal today is is what mental and physical illness looks like. I mean, just look, we're like 90% of the population is metabolically sick. 90% of Americans are also either overweight or obese. Um, we have close to 800,000 Americans dying from heart disease every year. Half of Americans develop cancer within their lifetime and half die from it, et cetera, et cetera. So that is what what the standard path looks like. So obviously it doesn't make sense to do something that's not working for already millions and millions and millions upon millions of people. And that's why I suggest, hey, if it were me personally, just do do the opposite of that and you'll probably be better off. So so what's causing this 40 year old male uh, to not change? I mean, it's so easy, but why, why don't they do it? And especially when they already know uh, they want to change and they know that they know they want to change, but yet they don't change. So here are some things I've noticed and uh, what people do. And there are actually like a myriad of things to, to acknowledge here, uh, but I want to keep these lives at like about 45 to 50 minutes max. So, so first and foremost, it's kind of, oftentimes people in a state of ambivalence love using excuses as a form of escape. Uh, I got this phrase from like Robert Kawasaki, so definitely not mine. But they, they love using excuses as a form of escape because it uh, it instantly shuts you. excuses. What they do, if you analyze it in detail, is they instantly shut your mind down from coming up with a solution to a, it may be a difficult problem, but with a solution to a problem, which a person inevitably needs. Uh, but sometimes it is too stressful or sometimes it requires them to hire a mentor, but they would rather spend that money on eating out and travel than hiring that mentor or advisor or whatever to get them out of that belief system. Because inevitably, um, you can't solve a problem with the same belief system that led to that exact problem. And that's actually what a lot of people try to do. Uh, inevitably, they have some kind of mind virus. And remember, a mind virus is something that hurts your, your mental and physical health long term or short term. And being ex having excess weight is is a health issue. So there's some some kind of mind virus going on that's leading to behaviors that are leading to excess weight gain that eventually will kill the host, and in the meantime hinders the health of the host as well. So a mind virus, a belief system that doesn't facilitate health conscious choices, is pretty much as detrimental as a, an actual virus such as what we had the last four years or so and eventually ends up killing the host and unfortunately also spreads from person to person. It's kind of just like a virus because if people have kids, they spread these ideals to, to their kids, which inevitably also develop those same health problems like overweight people, for example, have overweight pets, ironically, you know? And they also spread these ideas to their friends uh, as well. So they kind of invite them to participate in behaviors that led to their weight challenges such as eating out frequently, uh, drinking alcohol, uh, staying out late at night, et cetera, et cetera, and not having, um, you know, respectful, healthy boundaries at work for one reason or another, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, also not being selfish, you know, uh, in, in my opinion, you have to, at the end of the day, if you want something to last long term, you have to obviously be very crystal clear about your core values but then you have to be selfish in the sense of saying no to things that uh, that kind of impact those core values in a negative way. So sometimes if you catch yourself saying yes to things where in, in short, you, you want to say no to them, that's an example of not not being respectful of your boundaries, et cetera, et cetera. So, so inevitably people have a lot of excuses and they use these excuses as a form of escape. One of the most common ones is like, I don't have time to take care of myself. I don't have time to work out, which you don't even need to do to lose weight. You do not need to work out to lose weight. Uh, weight loss is 100% dependent on your nutrition and lifestyle choices, mainly your nutrition. 
and muscle gain is dependent mainly on like lifting weights and working out and stuff of that sort but you do not need to work out to lose weight so in a sense it's like what what are you, what are you talking about like you don't have any time etc cetera, etc cetera, because you're already eating right and all you really need to do is change your diet to lose weight so what kind of time are you talking about and here's a good way to look at it they say i don't have enough time but really this is just an excuse to once again shut their mind down from coming up with a solution, which inevitably is what they need to get closer to happiness um, and just be at peace in their life and just live a peaceful life. Because inevitably, even being healthy is, condition, is a condition for an unconditional need of wanting to be happy and at peace, okay? So, so it, in a sense, they use these uh, excuses because maybe they just don't know a solution to the problem. Um, then they would need to hire a mentor, obviously, yeah, especially if they're not going to invest the time and the resources to eventually take courses and read a lot of books and then apply that information to solving their own problem. They could do that, uh, but that's just more time intensive and typically takes quite a few years. But I'm a big believer in becoming your own mechanic. It's just a lot of people aren't in a good state of mind to, to do that either. That's why oftentimes getting mentorship in the beginning um, would help them quite a bit. So they say no time, once again, excuse. But really, let's look at it objectively. So what do they mean by no time? Let's just look at the numbers. So everyone has 168 hours in a week. That's how much hours there are in a week for literally everybody, okay? Uh, so let's say this 40-year-old male is working 40 hours a week. They sleep. They're not even sleeping these hours, I guarantee it. Their average American sleeps about five hours a day. But let's say they're sleeping eight hours a day. So that's 56 hours a week. And let's say they hang out with their friends and family for 15 hours a week, which really nobody even does. And they run errands for about five hours a week. So that leaves them with 52 hours, 52 hours of free time every single week, every single week. So that's two full days and four hours of free time every week even after 40 hour workday, even after sleeping eight hours a day, even after hanging out with friends and family for 15 hours a week and having five hours for errands per week, every week. And it takes, if you want to optimize, like I'm talking about peak optimization for the average citizen, not like an Olympian or anything or a professional athlete, but just for the average citizen, it takes about 10 hours a week to really optimize your mental health, your physical health, and your aesthetics, whatever goals they may be, about 10 hours a week. And honestly, you could probably even do it in like eight to seven hours because you do not need to work out uh, four to five days a week. You don't even need to do that. Like I even mentioned for the fat loss clients, you don't even need to work out, okay, to lose body fat. That's a big misconception as well. So where, where are the hours going? And if a person is really wants to change, it's important to write these numbers down and see where they're going and see if you can allocate them to more health conscious choices. So for most, for most people, all those hours are going basically to social media. And I would say on average, that's like easily three to four hours a day, three to four hours a day, no problem. Social media or watching TV or stuff of this sort. And if you have a smartphone, just look at the history of your phone. I think it's in settings and how much time you spend on each application. And you will see that's the case. And if it's like four hours, four hours a day, you know, multiply that by 10 days, that's 40 hours already. And uh, then you get the same individual that is also telling you that they don't have time to, to work out or even go to the grocery store to get their meals or even cook their meals. But yet they have you know, three to four hours a day to cruise around on, on social media, dating apps, uh, YouTube, uh, watching TV, et cetera, et cetera. The deeper story behind this is they use oftentimes this, uh, uh, these social media uh, programs or whatever as a form of dissociation from once again being in a situation they don't want to be in. So they kind of just dissociate and numb themselves out with that. Some people use medical drugs, some people use actual drugs, alcohol, food, et cetera, et cetera. It's just a form of dissociation from being in a position you don't want to be in uh, for already a long time 
and not having a solution of how to get out of that situation. So just very common uh, survival tactic used by the psyche to, uh, to get the central nervous system to get your body to survive better. Because inevitably, that's the only purpose of the central nervous system is to, is to get you to survive better. And that's it. So once again, we have 168 hours in a week. Even if you spend 40 hours a week working, 56 hours a week sleeping, 15 hours a week um, with friends and family, five hours a week for running uh, for errands. You still have two full days and four hours a week of free time every every single week, week after week after week after week. And it only takes 10 hours a week to optimize your mental and physical health. So the excuses, the excuse of, of I don't have enough time is once again, just an excuse. It's not reality. Uh, pretty much everyone has enough time. And if for for one reason or another, like you don't, then it's definitely you have to have some coaching on proper time management and maybe some coaching on how to, how to start learning to say no to things that take your energy and attention away from allocating them to your health and fitness goals. So one thing you can do is, okay, I got all my health and fitness goals out of the way, then I can start saying yes to things. But if I haven't gotten that out of the way yet during the week, then I have to start saying no to things and start saying yes to my own physical and mental health, et cetera, et cetera. But again, it totally makes sense that this person is, uh, you know, 30 to 40 pounds overweight uh, and having this kind of belief system that they don't have enough time. Uh, it's just another layer, another facade uh, that's leading them to their, their weight challenges. Because if they had a healthier belief system, uh, they, wouldn't ha- they wouldn't be 30 or 40 pounds overweight, which is not healthy at all. It's not normal at all. And it's just, once again, totally normalized by a pathology because it's so common, but it's, it's not normal in any way. So time, no time. I mean, uh, you guys, I interviewed a few business executives, okay, a few business owners. One of them had two kids and nine businesses and still got super ripped in four months and at 50 years old with zero drugs. And I had him freaking use creatine monohydrate as a supplement and that's it, okay? Okay, he has nine businesses. Come on, what's going on? Uh, And most of the people also just from personal experience that I hear saying I don't have time, they have actually the least going on. Uh, just there are some rare exceptions, no absolutes, but the ones I hear saying they have no time. Once you look at their time sheet, you'll see like they have literally nothing going on and they're spending all of their time just dissociating on random random activities, just random stuff. Uh, social media, just randomly getting lost here and there, et cetera, et cetera. So something to evaluate for those people that are in the gray area and know that they are overweight and know that they are doing it to themselves but don't know how to get out of it this could be one thing you'd want to look at and it's the weekend so why not sit down write down your whole schedule see where all your hours are going take a look at your um, phone see how much time you're spending on social media every day it's quite a bit i guarantee you way more than you think and maybe it would benefit you to delete all those apps especially if you're not uh especially if you don't have an online business and have it only on your computer. I'm not saying delete it completely, but I'm saying just have it only on your computer and that alone will decrease the amount of usage quite a bit. But at the end of the day, the thing that would decrease the most usage is really finding out uh, what you're using that social media or whatever to dissociate from in most cases. That would be the best result. So another another excuse that people use, and once again, excuses are kind of a, as a form of escape from taking responsibility and finding a solution to oftentimes a hard problem, which inevitably is the only thing that will get a person closer to where they want to get. So another thing I hear often is I just don't have the money to be healthy. Well, the good news is it is actually far more costly to be unhealthy directly and indirectly than it is to be healthy. And given the fact that the average American spends eight to $16,000 a year on non-essential expenses without even thinking twice about it, like totally under the radar, zero thought into it, eight to $16,000 a year, completely gone on just eating out, um, international travel or local travel, little day trips, um, subscription services, alcohol, uh, whatever, stuff of this sort, sometimes drugs as well, uh, Sometimes also a lot of times paying for health health problems, you know, Uh, in terms of per capita, the America spends about $14,000 a year uh, on just 
per person for their health issues and were yet the sickest sickest humans in the history of the human race, period. In like the two plus million years that, that various human species have come and gone, 28 plus human species have come and gone over, over, the, um, over the centuries. And we're like literally the sickest humans in the history of the human race ever. And spending the most money on healthcare. And you think it would be the opposite. You think you're investing more into healthcare, but of course, investing more into symptom management healthcare isn't gonna make you healthy. Because in my opinion, you're never you're never gonna find health in a pill. <laughs> obviously, <laughs> obviously, man, we shouldn't even be having this discussion. So that's another excuse a lot of people have, and it's an excuse. Once again, it's just a story. It's a lie they tell themselves, and then force themselves to believe in the lie as a truth. And then they do this for so many years and decades, they get lost on. Um, what is truthful and what is a lie anymore and uh, that it's like a complete mess once again no absolutes there are some cases where a person generally just is dead broke and but it, but it's far in between so once again average american spends eight to sixteen thousand dollars a year on non-essential expenses no problem uh, but once they need to spend that money on their mental or physical health then they're like oh i gotta think about it you know i got to check with my accountant and strategize this and stuff of that sort, but you know, no one's strategizing about going out and eating, which is usually a 300% markup from a meal you can make an equivalent of at home. You know, no one strategizes those little things, but those little expenses add up to your probably one of your biggest expenses at the end of the year. So, for example, you don't even have to shop organic, even just buying whole food is already amazing. Whole food meaning like the steak, the broccoli, the uh, the fruit. That's already amazing. And even if you get 2000 calories of just whole food, you're looking at spending around, you know, seven to 10 bucks a day on 2000 calories of whole food, you know, like steak, uh, chicken, broccoli, fruit, water, et cetera, et cetera. And you go out and eat one meal, it's like 20 bucks, 30 bucks at a restaurant with tip and tax and then driving there. You have to calculate the total cost of that meal. How much gas did it take you to drive there? Did you have to pay for parking? The tip for the waitress, the tax, uh, the actual meal itself. All of a sudden, uh, $10, which is required for all day of eating, much healthier food on top of that, uh, that's way cheaper than obviously that 30, 25 to $30 meal you just paid for. And once again, don't think twice about it. But then it totally makes sense that this specific individual is, is 30 to 40 pounds overweight with this type of uh, like mind virus that's leading to poor lifestyle and nutritional choices and inevitably leading to that excess weight gain and various health challenges. So for example, like if you were to buy even organic, like at least USDA organic certified food per year for about 2000 calories a day, it will cost you about five to $6,000. So five to $6,000 for very health positive food that are going to keep you lean that are going to keep your skin looking pretty good, pretty solid. Uh, there's more to health, obviously, than nutrition, but nutrition is one of those big pillars. And uh, keep your digestive gr digestion great, testosterone higher, et cetera, et cetera. And um, that's too expensive. But then, you know, spending eight to sixteen thousand dollars a year on uh, just sugar highs at best. Oh, that's that's about right. You know, I've seen a lot of people say like, oh. Um, you know, like a lot of people contact me and they're like, well, I want to accomplish this and this. And I'm like, well, you should just try taking this course first. I make like no money off of the courses I recommend. They're not even my courses, but you should try this course. And it's like 500 bucks, you know, for like a week course on fundamentals of holistic health. Because I think just a course like that would be amazing uh, for, for everyone. I, I cover that a lot with my clients as well, but just the courses are out there. And a lot of them were like, oh, that's too expensive. And then, you know, two weeks later, I see them taking pictures on like some trip in Europe or something. And that's like 3000 bucks. And uh, for like two week trip, two to three thousand dollars. And then they returned back after that two, two to three week trip to the very environment that led to all their pathologies. And then they forgot the trip, but then back to the exact pathology that they've normalized and then wondering why they're getting heavier and heavier year after year. See it all the time. And it's like totally under the table uh, for a lot of people. It's done unconsciously. Uh, may, maybe not unconsciously, consciously for sure, because like 
uh, corporations in America have done like a marvelous job at brainwashing uh, Americans to believe what isn't important is important and what is important is least important. So, you know, being in touch with your soul, your mental and physical health is the most important thing for you. Uh, and it sets the foundation to your overall happiness in life and the ceiling. So, for example, if you're thriving in all aspects of life, uh, but you have severe low back pain or cancer, let's say your health is overall, let's say, at a C grade, then your overall experience of life would be at a C grade. You see how that works? Although you're at an A grade pretty much everywhere else in all of these other, in all of these other aspects, et cetera, et cetera. But once again, people have normalized it, so they continue to, to live a state of, of, of obesity, misery, and disease their whole entire life, and then do something super silly, like blame their genetics or something uh, somewhere down the line. So, so no money. Once again, no absolutes, but 99.999% of the time, it's literally just use it, used as an excuse to shut the mind down from creating real change and thinking about what needs to happen to create that real change, which usually means changing the person that's causing the disease. And um, to find that person, look no further than, than a nearby mirror. And you'll find the source of all your problems. Uh, okay. So another thing which you've kind of, uh, kind of hinted at, what keeps people in a state of ambivalence, and it's easier today than ever, is an endless... Uh, list of distractions. Okay. So travel, this is a great one. I see a lot of, um, let's say this 40 year old male, for example, we're using him as an example here for all of these things. Let's say hypothetically, he doesn't like his job, doesn't like the co the naggy coworker, the chittery chattery coworker, um, doesn't like the projects he's doing, whatever. And, um, and every chance he gets, some new money he makes, he spends that money traveling, for example, uh, just to kind of get away because he's worked so hard, uh, he needs to reward himself or something of this sort or whatever lie the person tell, tells themselves to make it believe like there is a truth. And um, as Walensky would say, healing cannot begin unless you start acknowledging the lies you are telling yourself. And it's so important, especially in a state of ambivalence. So important, and you need to definitely slow down in life to even be able to hear these lies. Because if you're in a myopic state, one deadline after another, 50 hours of work, work week after week, uh, a lot of pressure with deadlines or whatever, eating highly inflammatory foods, um, instead of listening to, your, to the pain teacher, which your body communicates, you, communicates to you with pain, back pain, uh, depression, et cetera, et cetera. These are all signs and symptoms that something's wrong. So instead of taking action and coming up with a solution, the American way of life is let me just drug medically drug myself t into oblivion and not even worry about having to change the person that's causing all of these issues uh, because I'm just so stressed out. I need them to be on the side. But really at that point, what's really most important is to really listen to that pain teacher uh, and take appropriate action because if you don't, it's just going to keep getting louder and louder and louder. And then the person gets to 50 and has cancer and they wonder what happened, you know, and stuff of that sort or something serious of that sort, because, you know, cancer, excess weight gain, these things take like decades to form. They don't happen overnight. Uh, a person doesn't become 40 pounds heavy overnight. It just doesn't happen. It takes a lot of like money. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort to become overweight and develop a certain disease. If you think about it, you know, um, how much money it takes to sustain an obese physique with food, you know, how much processed food you need to invest in. You need to go out of your way, go consistently day after day after day, buy this food, eat the food, uh, make yourself eat that food, then kind of look in the mirror, and not be happy with what you see. And then make up some stories to keep doing that very behavior that that is not making you happy. You know, so it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of dedication, and it takes a lot of effort. Okay. Uh, and then on top of that, um, remember, you can't become obese unless you're eating a tremendous amount of processed food. It's just not going to happen. 
And processed food is so expensive if you count the amount of nutrition you get per calorie. Okay, so I was helping a friend uh, with a small house construction project a few weeks back, and I went to Heb. It's a grocery store. It's kind of like a middle level, I'd say, maybe even a little bit lower level. I mean, great store, amazing prices, lower level store, just to get some steaks and eat them. And the prices for the steaks, they're unbelievable. I mean, they are so great. The prices are so amazing. And I'm walking around the store. I'm getting like steak. I'm getting steaks mainly. They had some wild fish there too. And uh, some frozen bag of vegetables. And uh, pretty much my food for the three days was like, I don't know, 30 bucks, you know, something so, so small. And then I see everyone else there, like 70% of their cart is processed food. And there's a direct correlation between the percentage of processed food in their cart and how obese they are. So if it's above, I'll say 20%, and you guys can do this anytime. It's the weekend, go to the grocery store, look at people's carts and take a look at how they look. And you will see a direct correlation between the food they're buying and how obese and they are and how obese inflamed and they always have these weird skin issues, like very, very poor looking skin. Direct correlation. And I would say if their cart is even 20% processed food, they will be overweight. If their cart is filled with nothing but fruit, vegetables, and meat and water, you will look at their physique, they will be lean. Even if they're not working out, they will be thin, okay? Even if they're not working out, I guarantee you they will. But the second they start throwing in those chips, um, those frozen meals, etc., etc., whatever they call them, I haven't even purchased those in ever, uh, you will see if it's over 20%, they are overweight. If it's 50% or above, they're obese. Almost one-to-one -one correlation. Uh, please go to the grocery store and try to prove me wrong this weekend. Uh, I hope you guys do. I hope you guys do, but I've just never been able to see it. Uh, almost direct correlation. And the funny thing is, is when, when I was watching them check out, they're spending hundreds of dollars a week on this food. It's crazy. And then if I took them to the whole food aisle of that same grocery store and say, hey, you can get all of this steak, chicken, uh, fish, etc., for like half of that price of what you just spent on all that processed food, they will look you in the eye and say, that stuff's too expensive. And that's crazy to me, but that totally makes sense that they have this mind virus that gets them thinking along those lines and not seeing the reality of the situation. They are unfortunately inflicted with a mind virus that is killing them, just like a normal, normal virus, like COVID, for example. And it is killing them. Uh, they're, the, the saddest part is, is it's totally under the radar for most of these people. I mean, they're totally, uh, totally brainwashed by like the industrial food system and, and corporate America and stuff of that sort. And uh, the sad part is, is living a health conscious lifestyle is actually far less expensive and far more rewarding than living a life full of obesity, misery, and disease. So, okay. Distractions can come in the form of travel whatever. Also in socially acceptable things like working too much. Workaholism is totally accepted and applauded in the U.S. And a lot of people use work to dissociate from a life they don't like or a life that has no meaning to them personally. And they use work to basically avoid that or dissociate from that. Vince is in the house. We got to catch up, man. It's good to hear from you. We're talking about ambivalence today and what keeps people stuck in that gray zone of wanting to change, but then never actually changing. Uh, we're kind of coming to the end here. I got to finish this one off kind of quick, guys. But distractions, that's another thats another form of escape a lot of people use that keep, keeps them stuck. So these distractions could take the form of travel. I see, like, if in my opinion, if I were overweight and on a bunch of medical drugs that I didn't want to be on, I'll be spending like all my money on books, health books, courses, maybe hiring a mentor. I wouldn't be spending that money on travel um, until I got until I got my health level to a neutral. Remember, just not being overweight is 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 being neutral, and then it's time to begin your health journey from there. 
So other forms of dissociation, typical ones are like social media, drugs, medical drugs, alcohol, positive reframing is, is a very common one too. So taking the negative and turning it into the positive, uh, like, uh, oh yes, I'm 40 pounds overweight, but I'm only on two medical drugs and you know, my coworkers on 12. So I'm doing okay. Like kind of framing it, distorting reality and turning pathology into normalizing pathology by using positive reframing, positive psychology has a place in time, but oftentimes it's just used to, to keep people stuck in, uh, in situations far longer than they should be and, and want to be sometimes their entire life, sometimes their entire life. So other things that keep people change, I'm going to summarize these quick guys is, is normalized pathology. So unfortunately these days it's, it's normal to be like very overweight, be on various medical drugs, uh, chasing health symptoms all of your life. You know, today it's, oh, my lower back. Tomorrow it's gut issues. The third day it's, oh, now I have high blood pressure. Oh, now I have depression, whatever. And just their whole entire life is chasing one symptom after another. And because everyone is basically in this state with nine out of 10 Americans being metabolically sick right now, um, it could act as an incentive for people not to change because it's just so normal. People don't even know it's pathology 101. They see it's like normal. They're like, oh, this is how life is supposed to be. But that is completely not true. And it's sad that it's become that way. Uh, but, and it's totally nothing to do with genetics. Genetics is maybe one out of every few thousand cases. The rest of the time, the rest of the time, if you want to know who's causing like all your weight challenges and your health issues, like I personally would just go to the mirror and just look in the mirror and then you'll find the reason for all of your challenges just by simply looking in the mirror. So, yep, we covered that. Yeah, another solution that keeps people in a state of another problem is is uh, any journey is going to be hard in the beginning and they see setbacks in the beginning as catastrophic, especially people that have possibly depression. Then they over catastrophize everything and make everything permanent. So if they see one setback, they see it way bigger than it actually is. And they presume that setback is going to be permanent for forever. Not the case. Every journey is always difficult in the beginning. Uh, in anything you do, like learning a new language. It's freaking difficult in the beginning. And the first time you actually try to speak it in a real world situation, you might sound like super stupid and might be a little bit embarrassed, but that's just how it is. And that's how you have to, you have to realize that just, that's just normal and it's totally fine. And it's actually like a good thing because you're taking action and you can learn from it and kind of progress from it. Oftentimes in those beginning stages, I feel that's when a good mentor is pivotal. It's so important because they could really instill those good belief systems into you and give you action steps that have actually been proven to work. I'll just recommend with coaches, uh, you got to be careful, um, especially in the online space and in person space. Um, just make sure they have like a laundry list of successful testimonials of people that had your similar challenge and have overcome that challenge with that program. This doesn't mean the program would work for you. Um, it just means that there is an increased chance that it would work for you because it's worked for, let's say, you don't want to be type two diabetic anymore. And this coach has, a, you know, 10 clients that are type two diabetics and no longer type two diabetic on the program. Okay, so there's something in the program that works for type two diabetes. But if they have like no testimonials or very few testimonials or their testimonials are, um, you know, just like, like a sentence from some random person that they probably maybe even made up, that's already like a huge red flag. So I would be like, okay, so, you know, in, the, in your description on social media, you said you've helped hundreds of thousands of people internationally transform their lives, but you have like two testimonials on your whole page, you know, like where are these thousands of people you've helped? Like, why aren't you, you know, showing off their success? Why is it only pictures of you? or your accomplishments or stuff of that sort. Another thing I've learned too with hiring so many mentors myself is degrees are okay, but they're not as important as let me see your work. You know, where are your testimonials? That's going to be the most important because I've hired many people with PhDs and they've kind of just fallen short for one reason or another because 
maybe they just don't have enough clinical experience or they do have clinical experience, but they're just not not good at what they do. You know, they may know the information, but they're not good at, pl at applying the information in real world challenges, which is another skill set in and of itself. Um, you're not like an academia where you're just presenting information. You need to know real world challenges and how to take this academic inf information and get it and have it actually apply in a real world setting under real world challenges in a world, especially a country like America, that doesn't facilitate health conscious choices. So that uh, as well. So that's another that, another thing to consider. Um, another thing to consider with coaching, I mean, if they're not giving you like a two to three hour assessment upon first meeting you, which usually includes about like an hour Q&A to really get to know your backstory, then probably a lifestyle assessment. Um, I do a lot of stool testing with a lot of my clients to gauge at what's going on with their digestive system. Um, if they don't do like a mechanical assessment with you, I also do like another hour personality assessment towards the end of the program with them as well, et cetera, et cetera. If they're not doing all of that upon first meeting you or some kind of some, some kind of similar system, um, that's another red flag. And then I'll definitely not hire that person. Even if you go to a doctor and it's a quick like five minute Q&A and all they do is talk to you about symptoms and not the root cause of that symptom and then prescribe a drug, for you right away, like instantly, I would personally leave right away. Uh, that's me personally. You're welcome to do whatever you like. So, okay. Um, so that covers that covers some things that keep a person in a state of ambivalence and not changing in this kind of gray zone. And the longer they're in that gray zone and don't really take action, unfortunately, the more they get frustrated. Frustration builds up. And then the more maladaptive behavior has to form, which leads to even worse symptoms, which in this case, you know, it's a 40 year old male that's 30 pounds overweight, but then you see them at 50. Now they're 40 pounds overweight. You see them at 60. Now they're 50 pounds overweight and on like six different medical drugs. And this happens uh, very, very consistently, this kind of pattern, very consistently. And the first step, once again, is, is really just being clear about um, what lies like, do you happen to be telling yourself that keeps you stuck? And, you know, once you come to that realization and just be truthful that they are lies and they're told basically to not take action and change, then you can start taking action and changing. Okay, so guys, I'm going to cut it short today. Uh, but state of ambivalence keeps people stuck for forever. It's sad to see. And they're definitely doing it to themselves like 99.999% of the time. Um, and it is what it is, you know, the best I could do is just give out this information and also just kind of live the example of, you know, being the change I want to see in the world. And then hopefully it helps whoever is interested in listening, but either way, I wish you guys the best on your journey and, um, have a good weekend. Okay. Take care.